Okay, so it's uh, 4.15, time to get started. And again, what I will do well, a bit later today or tomorrow at latest, <clears throat> I will take this empty uh, part off from the recording. And uh, that's also in uh, YouTube, so it will be more convenient to you. Lecture number four. So look at this. So we just met and we almost, you know, ready to, to see how is a first midterm exam. Now, today's lecture is a little different than what we've been discussing so far. And uh, it's going to be a little different because today we really, finally, we're going to move on to dynamics. So if you look at the slides and your notes from the first three lectures, there will be no discussion whatsoever regarding the forces. And obviously, if we are speaking about the dynamics, the forces must be in a play. And uh, today they will eventually come into play. And uh, that's going to be an interesting story because, again, we're going to look at the kinematics. And we're going to look at the kinematics. From the kinematics, we're going to look what are the generalized coordinates. And our real challenge, which I will already tell to you, is to express the forces in terms of generalized coordinates. How that will happen? That will happen by using a concept called virtual work. And I know that it sounds scary, and it's a little bit scary, but together we can make it happen. Because there's one very, very important component in a concept of virtual work that is called virtual displacement. And this is our key to, to find a relation from the, I mean, our key to be able to express the forces in terms of generalized coordinates. Now, today, prior before looking at the dynamics, I, will, I would like to spend a little bit of time to really to give you the entire full picture about the kinematics. And uh, I don't know how long this will take, but really I would like you to be 100% sure how is a kinematics. So we're going to look again a little bit about a summary, what are the important components in a kinematics, and then finally, once that is all clear, then we're going to do kinematic analysis. And remember, today also, we're going to look at the Jacobian matrix and what is a physical interpretation of Jacobian matrix. Well, the physical interpretation, that actually comes a bit later because that too, eventually, is related to forces. But at this time, at least you can see a little bit about the kinematics from the Jacobian matrix. And Jacobian matrix already tells you how is a number or decrease of freedom because rows of the Jacobian matrix are associated to constraint equations and columns are associated to generalized coordinates. Those are the two information we need to know in order to be able to compute decrease of freedom of the system. Okay, so today, clear difference. So it's like almost like completely different world. This on, I mean, this direction and this direction and what makes them so different that's because of the forces. So we really wanted to discuss about forces from days on. Now, before that, here's a few, well, first, general information. Remember to sign in to Memea Seminar, so it's going to be after a week, three days, and so on and so forth. I, I actually took this screenshot yesterday, so it's going to be a week and two days, and so on and so forth. So highly recommended to, to do the registration I think, it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun for you to see how is really the state of the art simulation, how really are the digitalization in the current industry. So please consider to register. If not registering, then you are un unable to see the presentations. Okay, so that's a reminder for you. Now, here's a schematic information about multi-body system dynamics. And this is very, very important to understand. Now, let's walk through this slide together. So we're going to get started from the multi-body system. So multi-body system is a system that, as the title implies, consists of multiple bodies. Now, in this case, this hypothetic case, I have three bodies. So they form a multi-body system. This, in reality, could be this crank soft system. So it could be you know, the one that there is this beam-like body, 
connected to ground via revolutoin connection rod connected to beam like body by revolutoin and the piston body by by revolutoin and the piston in turn is connected to ground via translational joint okay important thing about multi-body dynamics is that the bodies are connected together via joints these joints these guys here will first of all limit the motion bus abilities of bodies because of the joints let's take a look at the for example the connection rod this guy here in the middle it is connected to piston and the other body by revolute joint so it cannot move as it wants instead it has to follow the motion of the crankshaft and the piston so it only can move in a certain way and that's because of the joints that's because of the constraints mathematically these that physically appears to be joints will be expressed by constraint equations constraint equations actually what they do is that they they limiting the motion possibilities similar way that the joints doing in a real life okay then let's take a look at the body then so let's take here body two as a, as an example what makes a body as a body well it makes the body is a body because of the infinite number of particles so the body actually consists of in our world a multi-body system dynamics it consists of very very small points these points in multi-body system dynamics are called particles so they are particle number one particle number two particle number three particle number seven billion something so there is a very very high number of particles that when you summing these features of the particles together that makes you a body okay let's look at this concept in a little bit of different perspective what we really wanted to do in all the dynamics is that we wanted to measure the particles with respect to reference coordinate system in our life again multi-body life we wanted to measure particles with respect to global coordinate system this guy here that is not moving anywhere so it's standing still no matter what and now what we wanted to do is that we wanted to describe these particles these very very tiny dots so they are not as big that is shown in the figure but they are really really tiny you must think that because there is a seven billion particles in this symbol body more so there's a really a lot of them so they're really really tiny what this tiny means well it means that it do not have a rotation on the grace of freedom and they these particles they do not move with respect to each other and they cannot move because we are dealing with rigid bodies well in real life there is no such thing as a rigid bodies all bodies are always deformable but many of bodies the deformation is insignificant in terms of dynamic performance and that's exactly what we can assume here so we're assuming the deformation is insignificant so the particles cannot move with respect to each other so what we're going to do then remember our final goal here is to describe these guys which are many of them these particles with respect to global coordinate system so how we can make it happen we can make it happen with help of the body reference coordinate system body reference coordinate system is attached to the body so if body moves coordinate system will do the same if body rotates body reference coordinate system do the same and now this makes it possible to describe first of all there is the origin of the body reference coordinate system that's going to be this guy capital r and then we can account orientation of the body reference coordinate system it's going to be this two by two rotation matrix and then we have here this vector u bar that scans every single particle in a system look this is a vector of two components because look vector of two components so it's this vector consists of projection in global x and global y axis all right this is a two by two rotation matrix 
and the vector u bar that in turn is a vector of two components because it is with respect to body reference coordinate system. So what is the result then? This guy here is a vector of two components that are projection in the global x and global y direction. So what I want to tell you, why I'm doing this, why I'm that I'm telling this story you again, because this has to be completely clear to you when we are solving the kinematics and more importantly, when we are using this kinematics to solve the dynamics. So kinematics in kind of like the only thing you need to do, well, this is a kind of like cutting the corners a little bit, but still, in kinematics, you just need to figure it out what is a way that you want to define the particles in the system. We decided that this is this way, and now we just need to be consistent. So we're repeating over and over again this equation. And then what we really want to do with this equation, we want to identify variables in this equation. And those variables are called as a generalized coordinates. What we're going to do when we are starting start to deal with the forces is that we will express the forces in terms of generalized coordinates. That's how it goes. That already I'm going to kind of like releasing this information to you is that how we're going to make it happen. We will make it happen using this concept of virtual displacement. That is a key for success. Okay, sorry to repeating this, but we kind of need to do this over and over again. Again, variables we have in this equation are this Rx, Ry, and angle theta. Now the constraint equations, they are kind of function of these generalized coordinates. And because they are function of generalized coordinates, they're limiting the possibilities how these coordinates can change the numerical values. That in short. Actually, I think it maybe is even possible to explain the multi-body system dynamics in 15 minutes. I will give a shot when we're going to have a summary. I will try to explain everything within the 15 minutes. But now I don't know what's going on here. What is this? Ah, this guy is making some tricks to me. So I was here. Okay, so this is a summary from the last week lecture. So we last week we will look at the constraints. And we concluded that uh, constraints are really elementary part, really inherent component that is needed in a multi-body system dynamics. And constraints should be made such the way that they are not dependent on each other. And if they, for some lousy modeling policy, they, they are dependent on each other, then we are dealing with the redundant constraint. That means that we are constraining the same generalized coordinates, not just once, but more than once. And this is not the good modeling policy. So redundant constraint means that, that, that these generalized coordinates are eliminated same way, but more than one at a time. So that's what it is. This is this weird, you know, what, what is the deal? What's the deal with this guy? Because he's moving weirdly to left. Okay, anyway, so it can be a left if, you, if it wants. Now, what we're going to do in kinematic analysis. So we're simply going to take this vector of constraint equation. So this is a vector, sorry about my notation, which is a function of generalized coordinates. Again, remember what are these? These are the variables we use in a kinematics. So they are coming from this equation. Okay, and we have many of these equations. Now, if we end up to have a situation that we have equally many equations than number of unknowns, then we can solve it. So we can solve it by you do knowing nothing about the forces or anything else. Okay, this one here depends on how, I mean, number of this component here, this vector, depends on the number of bodies. Remember this song that everybody needs three generalized coordinates. They don't need law, but they need three generalized coordinates. Okay, so if you are dealing with the two bodies, you need to have six generalized coordinates. Now, if you have a system with six generalized coordinates and six constraints, six equations that are limiting the most possibilities, that's it. That's all you need to know because 
you can use this nonlinear set of equation. You set that to be equal to zero and you just solve it. And it's a little bit complicated because the nature of the equation, but doable, clearly doable. Then you differentiate this equation with respect to time to this equation, and you get the velocity. And velocity you can solve by substituting the solution, I mean, the necessary component to a solution of velocity. Almost the same thing for acceleration, and that's it. Then you have position, velocity, acceleration at the given time. Then you increase in the time and you redo the thing. So that's how the kinematic analysis performs. This one here is the one that is a little bit of challenging. It's a little bit of challenging because it is based on iterative process. We cannot get the solution at once, but we have to do a little bit of computing several times. We get better and better guesses what the solution supposed to be. Okay. What is this? So why is that they want to be in the left side? Let me see if all the slides... No, 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 it's not all the slides. It's just that these few guys, for some reason, they want to be in the left. So let them be in the left. Yeah, I think it is okay. So it's not looking too bad. Okay, so how is a kinematic analog system? All right, so this is a key for this is pretty much what we need so we need to get all the constraint equations that are function of generalized coordinates and most often they are also function of time and we just need to solve this set of nonlinear equations we can do that by using newton robson procedure and in newton robson procedure that's what we derived last week as a little bit of painful derivation but forget about that because we wanted to see how is that you can solve it. Okay, in Newton Robson, you actually computing something that is called Newton difference. And you can solve that by, you know, by computing this matrix. This is still a vector. And once you inverting this matrix and you put it that in the right hand side of the equation, that's what it makes it possible to get Newton difference. Newton difference is not yet a solution, but you can use an iterative process. So it's such that this is i plus 1 is equal than previous generalized coordinates plus delta q. That's how it goes. The kind that is extremely important component here is the one here, this matrix here. This matrix is called Jacobian matrix. You can get it very mechanically. You take uh, you know, each constraint equation of your system, 1 to all the way to nc, and you differentiate those constraint equations with respect to generalized coordinates. And now, I hold on, I, I made a mistake because I, my, my chat window is not visible. Okay, so you were just asking if the squeeze is, is on, so it's on, so you can take a look. What is the first squeeze? Okay, but I was about to explain the Jacobian matrix. So Jacobian matrix components needed to compute it are constraint equations and generalized coordinates. Remember what I told about the story about matching number of equations and unknowns. This guy is an unknown. This guy is a solution. And now if there's a matching number of unknowns and equations, it means that we have equal number of constraint equations and generalized coordinates. That means that this matrix here is a skier matrix. And it must be, have to be, because what we're going to do here is that we're going to invert this guy. And you cannot invert it if it is not the skier. There are some other requirements, but let's not worry about that this time. Okay. So, my first in-class quiz is this. Dimensions of Jacobian matrix tells you rotation of particle. Rotation of a particle. Okay, color of the body. Number of degrees of freedom. How gravity force is imposed to a body. And now let's take a look. Let's take a look. So may, let me see how many of you have already entered the answer. So to today's 
Oh, no, there's so many windows open that... Okay, so I see that I have here 82 students in my soccer team. And 48 of you already entered the answer. So here it is. Not, not that. I want to make this a bit smaller. Okay. No, no. I know. I know that you guys are thinking that it's hundred percent, but it's not going to be hundred percent. But it could be high. It could be high. Let Let me think. It could be all the way. The first number could be nine. 90, 95%. I'm thinking 95% success rate today. <laughs> you guys will be you guys will be disappointed if you start dreaming like. <laughs> okay, and I also like this this comment about the particle and how it rotates. Okay, and we have a competition is on, so guess is go ahead and guess it, and we'll see, we'll see. If it is 90 something, it's going to be, I'm going to smile, big smile. Let me see, I'm, uh, I organize my screens today a little bit of funny way, so it's, oh, I don't want to show that to you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we are waiting what it is. Um, seven students are not yet answered. Okay, so we only waiting five. No, less, no, three. Okay. 80. Okay, two are still missing. Maybe these two are not willing to give an answer to this in class quiz. Okay, so moment of truth. So let me show it to you. And the success rate today is. Ah, uh, look at this, so I might, uh, okay, but anyway, so look what the success rate here is 90, so I was right about that, and we have actually, we have winner here, so we have, let me see, at least one uh, student guessed this correctly, so uh, very good, very good, so let me see, it's just the one student, okay, let me put this to my notes. I'm not going to mention the name, but I can see that there is a good guess from one student. All right, so let's moving on. Now you can see that you know I my, my you know what I did here is that these are these questions that it, that appears in the side that they are how they appears in the Socrates are not one to one match because the first one I say rotation of a particle, which is definitely incorrect. So no matter what you select, you never ever select rotation of a particle because no, no, it's not, you know, that just makes no sense. Okay, color of the body, of course, makes no sense. No one voted that, which is a really, really good news. How gravity force is imposed to a body, you know. We haven't discussed about forces so far. No force discussion. We're going to get started to forces a bit later today, but not at the moment. Okay, here's a procedure for position level analysis. We looked this previous on Monday, last Monday shortly. So how it goes. So it goes such the way that you first derive the constraint equation and you compute the first J copy. You compute Newton difference. You update your generalized coordinates. And you should, of course, update your J copy. And you should, up oh, the one thing that is missing here, you should also update your constraint equation because those are function of generalized coordinates as well so update general oh my god this handwriting is like okay but anyways update constraints equations equations okay and then you check if this one here if you are close enough to solution you stop. If not, you redo the whole thing. You compute it again and you updated your coordinates and 
you keep on doing this until you reach the conclusion, meaning that this one here is less than predefined tolerance. That's what the iterative process means. Okay. What about these other levels? Velocity and acceleration level. Okay, this comes a little bit out of the blue sky, but you know, kind of like a little bit of given to you. But what I will do is that I will simply differentiate my constraints equation with respect to time. So remember I started this one. This is where I started. Now I will simply take this equation as it is. No thinking. And I'm gonna differentiate that with respect to time. Because you know the the way this is constructed, this is gonna be first of all J copy of matrix, which is denoted such the way that is C sub index Q. That means that this is a parcel C parcel Q matrix. Matrix. And then I have here velocity of ten wise coordinates, and then my constraint equations difference with respect to time. And then once you're solving this guy here from this equation, that's how it reads. Now we let me change the color of my band so make it this bit more clear. Now when you and let me try to take this off here. Okay, now you take this equation and you differentiate that again with respect to time. It's gonna be quite a bit of mess, but Let's make it happen. So the first one is quite simple. So you have here take up your matrix multiplied by acceleration of generalized coordinates, then the constraint equation that are differentiated twice with respect to time. Then you have here this guy here that is then differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates, and that result then is then multiplied by velocity. Okay, let's let's look at the next example that makes it clear now. And then I have you have here take up your matrix that is then differentiated with respect to time, and then multiplied by velocity of ten wise coordinates. A little bit of mess, I must that admit that. But what you get as a result of this is that you will simply go ahead and uh, solve this guy. Meaning you take all these components, you put them in the right hand side of the equation, and you inverting this. So you copy a matrix again. This already, I mean this guy, this equation and this equation already tells you that only way you can conduct the kinematic analysis is by having the equal number of constraint equations and generalized coordinates. Because if not, then this is not going to be a skewer matrix and you cannot invert it. Okay, so let's take a, here's a whole thing. So you started with the position level analysis, you solving the Newton difference, you update your coordinates, and once you're comfortable with your coordinates, then you're solving the velocity by using this equation. So it's a matter of substitution. And then once you're done with that, then you're solving the acceleration by using this equation here. And then you're adding the time, you're redoing, I mean, you don't do it, of course, you're allowing computer to do it for you. But anyway, so that's how the kinematic analysis is proceeding. Okay, now I'm thinking that, now I'm really, really hoping that this time we're going to have an in-class squeeze with 100% success rate. Next in class quiz, I will tell you already this time, will be related to this example. So now put the movie away, put the browser away and focus on me. Look at me. So I will explain this to you and don't do anything else. Don't send an email, don't use uh, WhatsApp, just focus on me. Okay, I have here a system that consists of one moving body. This one moving body is constrained to ground from the point P here by using a primitive joint. So you need to have one constraint equation here, then you have here a primitive joint, where another end is constrained to ground, so that's going to be a second constraint equation. The ID numbers you can select as you want, but just be consistent once you do the selection. And then you have here driven constraint. 
this guy here, this equation, because this tells that this point has to follow this equation no matter what. And the equation is sine time divided by 4 minus 1 divided by 2. That's constraint equation. So we have three constraint equations. We have one moving body, planar case, how many generous coordinates we need. Three, because everybody needs three generalized coordinates. And those three generalized coordinates are coming from the equation that we are using, you know, this R and then the vector U bar and then the rotation. So it's going to be this point will be described by using this equation that we are very much familiar with. Three generalized coordinates. This system have how many degrees of freedom? You can get that by comparing the number of generalized corners minus number of constraint equations. That's going to be, but you just need to do the math. You need to do the math because I'm about to ask this in, uh, in class quiz. Okay, so let's, um, let's follow this um, <clears throat> previous um, algorithm and let's uh, form the constraint equations. And once we have the constraint equation, then let's compare the J copy of matrix. Okay, so we will get started here from the point Q. This is where we're going to get started. And now in the point Q, we're going to describe the point Q by using the technique, the only technique we are aware of. So we're going to look at the how is a translation of the body reference coordinate system using this guy here. And then we're going to take the orientation of body reference coordinate system into account. So this one is here. Then we take the orientation of body reference coordinate system into account. And then we're going to use a vector u bar to travel here to here using body reference coordinate system. Okay. And then this point here cannot move as it wants. So first of all, its motion to global y direction is limited. It always has to stay in this line, meaning that the y must be equal to zero. That's why this component must be equal to zero. X direction. That too is constrained, so it cannot move as it wants, but instead it has to follow this equation that we provided or was provided in the previous slide. Okay? Clear. So what next? Next, we have to take a look at another. Ah, I jumped to the wrong place. So we have to look at another position here. Okay, so this is a bit further about this first point. So we, what I did here is that I'm substituting the information. So I'm substituting the vector u bar here and I'm doing the math. Vector u bar component is minus L divided by two. Length, by the way, is not given in this assignment, but we just need to assume that the length of the body is L. So we here, and we need in order to travel to this point, in the body reference coordinate system, we have to move minus L divided by 2 to X direction. Y direction, no need to move, so that's going to be 0. So that's why these constraints, two first constraints, are can be written like this. Point P, this point here, the same thing over and over again. So we just keep on using this equation over and over again with no thinking. Okay, so we first gonna go here again. This body reference coordinate system. We're gonna take the account the orientation, and we're just gonna use a different vector u bar to go here. And we're gonna introduce the constraint by using this guys here. Okay. Okay, so how it reads. So this time with the u bar x gonna be l divided by two because obviously we here we wanted to travel using this body reference coordinate system to this point here. So we have to travel l divided by two and this direction is obvious to zero. So this is your third constraint equation. Then with no thinking, you take your constraint equation, you difference it then with respect to generalized coordinates. And generalized coordinates are, because of the one moving body, we're going to have three generalized coordinates because of the one moving body. Because everybody needs three 
generalized coordinates. All right, this is how it looks. So look what we have. So we have equal number of columns and rows. So what is the number of degrees of freedom? That's my in class squeeze to you. So let me go and uh, take the next one. Number of degrees of freedom in this system. Options are, okay, first of all, let me tell you how you can do this, how you can solve this, this uh, in class quiz. You can either look at the configuration, you can look at, not configuration, but you can compute the number of generalized coordinates, number of constraint equations, or you can look at the dimension of the J copia matrix. Options are zero degrees of freedom, one degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom, 100 degrees of freedom. And the game is on. So guess what is a success rate? Okay, last time it was 90. This time it's going to be 90. Okay, so most soon... Oh, there's a question. So let me take a look at the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the sign here is pre-described motion. This is a motion which is defined by this constraint. So the point cannot move as it wants, but instead it has to follow this equation, meaning that this point Q must follow this motion in a global X direction. This equation in a global X direction. Now we have a game on. So we have 85. Okay, that's kind of low in my mind. I think it's going to be 90. Um, guys, you keep on saying 80. So it's going to be 90, not 80. So it's going to be 90. Come on. Where is your can do that? It's 100. It's going to be 100 today. 100% success rate. Come on, you guys are all guessing 80. So I don't think it is 80. It's higher than that. Here's my man. Here's my man. 81. 81. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see how many students are missing. Okay. No, oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's that's great. Now it comes ninety something. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the kinematic analysis. So I'm gonna first compute the Newton difference. So it happens like I just explained. You take your take up your matrix, you invert it. I mean, you do, of course you don't invert it because it is such the pain to invert the three by three matrix. But you are using symbolic math tool. What we gotta do in real life is we're gonna use a numerics to invert it. And then you take your constraint equations with no thinking, you just take your constraint equation, you place it there. This is your way you can update your generalized coordinates. You compute the updation, you update the constraint equation and take up your matrix and you redo the whole thing until numerical values of this vector is small enough. Soon, by the way, I'm going to go back to the in-class quizzes to, to, to check out the results. Okay, velocity analysis. So it's almost same, except this time we have to differentiate these constraint equations with respect to time because this is a component needed in velocity level analysis. All right, so let's do it. So let's uh, differentiate this one here with respect to time. First component is only one where the time is available here. So that's going to give you here 1 divided by 4 cosine time. And this guy here, there's no time mentioned, there's no time here. So those will be equal to zeros. But this is your velocity, so it's substitution that is needed here. And now I'm looking at the, my in-class squeeze. I can see that the nine students are still thinking what is a correct solution. So let me explain the roller, excuse me, acceleration, and then I'm going back to, to in class quiz. Okay, here's this painful expression of acceleration. This is something that you're familiar with. So this is Jacobian matrix. This you just get by differentiating constraint twice with respect to time. 
this is bad so we just have to do it no matter what this is something that I don't think it is very bad because J copy a matrix is not the function of time so it's easier okay first one this one here I have here J copy a matrix multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates so velocity I'm gonna just take a velocity vector of generalized coordinates and I do the math that's gonna give me a vector of three components these three components will be then differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates. Again, you just let the symbolic math tool to do it for you. You're going to get matrix, which is 3 by 3 as a result. And then you're going to multiply that by, again, by velocity of generalized coordinates. So that's how the result look like. Then you take this guy that is uh, constraint equation difference added twice with respect to time you're gonna get this equation this one here is zero because uh, um, const excuse me take up your matrix is not the function of time um, okay so are we ready to move on to in class quiz there are some questions like if the upper one is primitive joint Okay, this guy here, this point, I have two constraint equations like we just looked at. So there are two constraint equations. So one that is limiting the motion to global y direction, and one that is forcing this point to travel in a global x direction in a certain way. Certain way is this equation here. Okay. Now, is it or is it not? I mean, 100%. If 92, that will be that will be great. Okay, more than a 95, I will be I will be super super happy. Ready. Come on. Not happy. Not happy. I'm not happy because the solution, of course, is zero. Not one, not two. Oh, well, the good news is this. No one voted to 200. Okay. Why is this? Why is this? Because, you know, if you can see that the take up your matrix is a skewer matrix, that immediately tells you that you have a system with zero degrees of freedom. Zero degrees of freedom. Why? Okay. Because constraint equation, number of constraint equation is equal to the number of generalized coordinates. This is your solution, this is your unknowns. And you can always only solve the unknowns if you have enough equations to solve the unknowns. So if you have six unknowns, you must have six equations, otherwise you cannot just do it. It's just not possible to do it. So, based on the rows and columns from the Jacobian matrix number of degrees of freedom is zero zero another way to look at this is that we just you know look at this where was it here this is your vector of constraint equation so you can see that nc number is three sorry about my handwriting it's just that the, the screen is moving when i'm writing it number of generalized coordinates is 3 3 minus 3 is 0 major drawback okay but let's look at something amazing that <laughs> yes the success rate was i don't want to tell what was the success rate but it was eventually i guess that i just have to release it to you so the success rate was a 40 percent four zero percent not good. Not good. It's not one. So the one is not one because we have this motion constraint. So the constraint that is introducing this, this motion. So the constraint can be something that is forcing something to standing still or forcing something to move according to pre-calculated equation or predefined equation. Let's put it this way. Okay, so here, 
here it is. So I said that uh, today it's gonna be something amazing. So so what what happens today is that I'm gonna solve this this kinematics because now I have equations, uh, everything that is needed to compute the kinematics. So the, let's let's compute the kinematics then. So the, here is a MATLAB code which is really really nasty looking code. It's just that I, I have here evaluation of constraints. So this is how I how I compute the constraints. So this is just the code for the previous equation or to solve the previous equations. Then I have check copy a matrix. If you're not interested in our in our programming, you don't need to pay too much of attention if this and if you are interested in the programming still you should maybe skip this because the way this is put it or made it is was a kind of like uh, very fast and not carefully made. But anyways, but I have here the, the code and uh, let me solve the response to you. Okay, so hold on, let me just uh, take this one. Okay, and I will, okay, so let me try to make this as small as possible. And put it here. So let me run the system for you. Hopefully, oh, oh no 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 no! I want this to be visible. This one here. And here it is. Here is my visualization. Let me see if this goes out. Uh, I mean that is blinking like no limit. But what I what I just did was that I solved the response, the kinematics, by using the equation we just learned. And we kind of what I kind of got what I got as a result was angular acceleration. I got all the information: angular velocity of this one body, orientation of a uh, local coordinate system, meaning that is a body reference coordinate system. I got the uh, r x position. I got everything. So I was able to solve the kinematics. And now you may be like, oh my god, what a serious disappointment. Like, you spent several hours, a lot of time, and you got, you know, this blinking beam-like body that is moving, like, non-smoothly. That's not the point here. And the point is that you repeating this procedure for any system you want. So you can apply this wherever you want. You just take the system you create the constraint equation you compute to take copy and you follow the same procedure and you can get the solution so that's it and now it's not that this this simple planking beam like body but whatever system you want you can solve it so that's that's miracle in my mind that's really amazing but i know i got um okay so i got some complaints that the constraint equations or the number of constraint equations no, 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 it's, yeah, okay, fine. Comments are all right. So, what do you guys say? Should we have a break? By the way, today I, I um, what I need to do today is that I, uh, once I'm completing the, the next 45 minutes, I need to have a little bit of break because I'm in, um, online conference and the online conference is about to end at that time and I need to say something as a closing words so I'm uh, guessing that the next team session team session will get started a bit later so you guys are saying no break today that will be okay to me we can just continue today and then then have this team session a little bit of different time so what so please let me know your thoughts through the live chat. So it seems no break today which is completely fine to me. So what we can do is that I will continue. We will close around five. <laughs> okay, somebody have to go to gym. Yeah, teams at the four, seven, uh, excuse me, 5.45.
Right, so let's continue. So let me put it back. Yeah, yeah, so we're going to do and we, we will continue on just the one teams today. Maybe that's a more convenient way to have these lectures because you need to go to gym. Also, I need to go to gym. Actually, gym challenge is accepted. So if you want to challenge me, say chin up competition, I'm on. Just let me know how is your challenge. Okay. Now here's my next in class quiz. Kinematic analysis. What we just did can be carried out if you know one of the following items. Say about the bodies. Say that you know that it's not the beam like body, it's not the box like body, it's not the potato, potato set body, but you know the shape. Is that a, that's the word that's enough to, to compute or to carry out the kinematic analysis? Moments imposed to system. Remember what I just mentioned about the forces? Forces imposed to system. Constraints of the system. So those are the four options. And let me put the soccer day on. Next one. So shoot it. <clears throat> so what is necessary information to carry out the kinematic analysis? One solution only is correct. Only one is correct. And while you're doing it, I'm going to introduce you a second example, which is a not much more complicated system, but a little bit complicated than uh, the previous one. Oh, and then uh, I kind of, I'm smiling because <laughs> I'm looking at your cases about uh, the in-class quizzes. And now you say that this time it's going to be 100%. It's going to be 90 uh, the last time I was shooting very much off because I said that it's going to be 90 something and it was 40%. Like a serious disappointment. This time, uh, 90, 92. Okay, but let's look at this example here. So I have here two moving bodies. Two moving bodies. So how many generalized coordinates I need? Every body needs three. This body needs three generalized corners. This body needs three generalized corners. So it's a total of six. How many constraint equations I have? I have here revolute joint, revolute joint. So that's two, two. And here I have primitive joint and motion constraint. So it's a one plus one. So I hear this is equal to two. So there is a total of six constraint equations so it's zero decrease of freedom so i can solve this by using kinematics nothing else than a kinematics and i don't care about the forces i don't need to care about the gravity just do it uh, <clears throat> okay then there is a question uh won't q have two generous coordinates no we have just the two bodies this is a body num body one and this is body two so the number of generalized corners is always depending on how many moving bodies you have. Point is not a body. Okay. So then uh, let's move on. So this is an example that I saw a few weeks back. And uh, as a result of that, I got five constraint equations that are written like this one here. And this is, these two are related to constraint equation. I mean, the revolution that is in this end, these two were, or are related to revolution here. This one here was related to this primitive zone here that was constraining the motion in a global y direction. And now I'm going to just derive the one missing component, which is this driven constraint. And how can I make it happen? I express this point here using the equation, the only equation that I know, which is this one. So I'm substituting my information here. So I'm moving to B body B reference, body reference corner system, and accounting the orientation of body reference corner system B. And I'm using the vector U bar to travel here to here. That means that I have to travel to uh, L divided by 2 to x direction and 0 to y direction. And now I'm saying that this y direction have to follow this pre-described motion that is coming here. So that gives me one additional constraint. So that's my sixth 
constraint. My sixth constraint looked like this, and my full list of constraints, once I have this five that I got from the previous case added by this, is six constraint equations. Six generalized corners because the body one, excuse me, A, and body B. All right, and then I'm just gonna use the symbolic math tool, gonna compute to take copy. Take copy and consist of one, two, three, four, five, six rows. One, two, three, four, five, six columns because of the six generalized corners. So this is N, N and this is NC. So that's how it goes. All right. So then I'm uh, using this equation. I'm ready to. That's pretty much what I need to to go to compute the Newton difference. I'm taking my constraint equation. I difference added that with respect to time. I will get all the other components except the last one is function of time. So others are zero. The last one is a non-zero, and this is my velocity. And then the painful thing that is related to acceleration. Here, I just take, I have to take this guy here and this guy. Take up your matrix again, it's not the function of time, so this will be equal to zero, so you can neglect it. So I have my here, my take up your matrix multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates. That's going to give you a vector of six components. These six components will be differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates. You will get the vector, excuse me, matrix, so that is six by six. And then that is then multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates. And that's how the final solution looks like. This guy here, when you differentiate the constraint twice with respect to time, looks like this. And then you're ready to solve the system. And now, how is our competition about the success rate? So we have a lot of guesses, I can see that. <clears throat> so the correct solution is this one. Oh my god, it was this close. This close to get the 100%. Oh, look at the numbers, oh, look at the number here. 96 come on so today is not very uh, I mean that your performance is fluctuating quite a bit because you know the last one was very bad this one is really good so let's try to keep let's try to keep this level okay uh, well, let's take this off and let me uh, solve this one here by using again my MATLAB. I mean the MATLAB of course will look a little bit ridiculous because it's so simple case but anyway so let's solve it. and I need to take all these figures close to me oh where is it now oh uh, again plinking so visualization is of course no good but it's plinking so it's like like well not that so I'm thinking like this one here so this is standing still and it's moving like this okay I you know not impressive but here is again solution about angular acceleration, angular velocity of body one, orientation of local corner system body one, so on and so forth. So you can print whatever you want. So what is that we learn? So we learn that the kinematic analysis is not about the forces, it's all about constraints. So it's all about the constraints. So you don't need to care about the forces because it's just look at the, how the system will behave because of the constraints. And we can have constraints that are forcing something to stay together, 
force constraints that are forcing something to standing still, or forcing excuse me the constraints that are forcing something to move according to predefined bad. With that, where is my PowerPoint? Here. Here. Okay, so let's look at the something where the kinematics. Okay, so there's a comment that maybe you should check out the tutorials of this course. Yeah, of course, you know, this. if you want to simulate this, you know, there's a MATLAB code available, so you can modify the MATLAB code and make a simulation of your own. Okay, so here's um, something that we, where we use the kinematics. So uh, a few years back, we instrumented a bicycle. Uh, this is kind of like a bicycle, it looked like, okay, what's the deal with the bicycle? But the bicycle actually is a very challenging dynamic system. And a friend of mine, his name is uh, Arden Swap. he was actually, he'd been in a field of bicycle dynamics already a number of years. And he was able to make a journal article about the bicycle dynamics and what makes bicycle to be stable. And he published that in the science, which of course is outstanding accomplishment. And uh, he and then uh, other teams that are in the field of bicycle dynamics, they put together a question of motion about the about the bicycle, and we use that to solve the kinematics. And the one, how we solve that? Oh, let me take this off. Was that you know the bicycle model consists of three degrees of freedom, which are forward velocity, leaning angle, and steering angle. So what we measure those information, here's an instrumentation to measure the steering angle. You know, this is measuring the forward velocity. This is measuring the leaning angle. We use this information, this measured information, and because the system in this have three degrees of freedom, we use these measurements as a constraint, as a driven constraint, and we force we force the bicycle to follow the measurements. And once we were able to do that, we got the idea about the full state of the bicycle. And that in turn was used to estimate a little bit about how are the, how large are the forces. This has now become to be in a field of forces that impose the bicycle. Now again, really, really lousy visualization, but this is coming from the measurements when somebody's riding the bike. Now we're measuring it and then later we're going to switch this to be an estimation of forces. So this is something that can be considered as a virtual sensor. So simple measurements are turned out to be more or are enhanced by using a model. And this time the model is kinematics. It's just kinematics. Okay, so with that, just an example. But amazing stuff is this, you know, science. By the way, there is a this magazine, this technical mama, technical mama, and uh, Arden was interviewed in technical mama because of this this article in Science, and you of course want to know what makes bicycle to be stable. Problem is that is not easy to explain it because it comes from the combination of five different parameters. So it's not that easy to say that it is gyroscopic forces that helps or. The, the certain geometry that helps the bicycle to be stable. It's a combination of various matters. So the interpretation is less straightforward. Sorry about that. Okay, now, are you guys ready? Because next, we will leave the kinematics. We will leave this, you know, this kind of simple life, but we're going to move on to more challenging life. That's going to be at the beginning, it looks gonna it kind of look scary, but once we take a close look about what exactly is a scary thing, you know, you soon will realize that actually is not bad at all. And I'm gonna be here to help you to make an interpretation of every every single component. Okay, but let me let me outline the problem here and why we want to do this. So why is that? You know, how the whole dynamics will be solved. Okay, so here I have again this potato shaped body we look at in the very beginning of today's lecture. So, what we wanted to do, 
is that we wanted to look at the forces and we have roughly speaking two different kind of forces and these two different kind of forces comes clear when we are writing here the Newton second law so we have external applied forces and inertia forces um, according to D'Alembert's equation. D'Alembert became famous because he wrote this equation like this. Come on. Well, actually, he not, you know, he, his message was much deeper than that. He was actually saying that externally applied forces and inertia forces can be treated similar way. That's exactly what we're going to do. And we will get started from externally applied forces. So what we're going to do for that Hold on. For these external applied forces then. Well, we're gonna express the forces. All the forces, well now I should I need to write this again. External applied forces and inertia forces by using generalized coordinates. Why? Because generalized corners tells us that how is a configuration of a system. So if you have one potato shaped body, you need to know these three coordinates to be able to express where the body is located and how is its rotation. So we have to know these three unknowns. And that's why we wanted to express the forces in terms of generalized coordinates. Sounds doable. But it's not that easy. And it's not that easy because, you know, the forces typically are expressed by using global coordinates. Here's an example. So I have here a point force that is applying to this particular point here. An amount of force with respect to global x and y axis is Fix and Fy, Fay. So those are my components. And you can see that now we have a problem because the force consists of two components and we have three coordinates so they don't match two is not three so we have to build the bridge we have to do something here we have to build the bridge to be able to express this one here in terms of these generalized coordinates and that's what we're gonna do next Okay, so how are we going to make this happen then? We're going to make it happen by using this concept of virtual work. And virtual work, well, we, we, I'm going to explain the virtual work to you in a second, but you know, virtual work is basically their work multiplied by virtual displacement. And uh, virtual displacement is something that we need to we need to study quite a you know a little bit to, to understand what it, its role. It's different than uh, usual displacement or real displacement because the real displacement takes a place during a certain period of time. Virtual displacement we are assuming that when the displacement takes a, takes a place the time is not running, so time is kind of frozen, so time is put it in a hole. I don't know how the heck you can make it in real life, and we shouldn't look this in the real life, but more like mathematical tool that we need, and we needed that because we have this series which matching. So we have two components and it should be three components. We need this concept to convert two to be three. Okay. And we're going to do that again by using the concept of virtual work. So virtual work, like, you know, mentioned here, like real work consists of dot product of forces as displacement. So it forces at the, at the direct, excuse me, displacement at the, at the direction of forces. That's what it is. But in virtual work, the time is not running. This is not important to you. Because basically what you wanted to do is that you want to have this mapping that converts two to be three. Okay, so let's look at the situation. Now I have here a beam-like body. And in the beam-like body, I have here force, which is a 
vector expressed by using global corners. So it's x and y. So this con this component here consists of two components. So it's a f x f y. Now what I would like to do with this force is that I would like to convert these forces to be expressed by using r x r y and angle theta because those are my generalized coordinates. Okay, so let's make this happen. First thing that I will do is that I will express the point where the force is applying. How? Well, that's going to be super straightforward because the only equation that I know is the one that tells where the point is located with respect to global coordinate system. This equation here. So I'm first going to travel from the origin of the global coordinate system to body reference coordinate system. Then using this rotation matrix, I'm accounting the orientation of body reference coordinate system. And with help of vector u bar, I'm going to call the point where the force is applied. Okay, now I know where the force is, and I know how much is the force. So I'm kind of having all the components that I needed. Now I'm going to simply look at the how is a work and where to work. Let's get started from the work. So work is a dot product of force and displacement. Okay, how can I note the displacement? I note the displacement when I know where this point here is in this time and after a certain other time when it is moved like here. So this is my displacement. And it's a difference from the original configuration and configuration after a while. This is my work. This one here can be expressed as delta r. And the delta r, I need to magnify this a bit, is exactly this displacement. That's your delta R. Let me write it here. So that's your delta R. Okay. Now, when you compute this delta R in real life, you have to understand that the, this vector here is function of time. So delta R look like this. Now, what we're going to do in the... Oh, this is a little bit too small. So let me make it a bit bigger. Oh, here. Now, what we're going to do in a case of virtual displacement. Now, you need to pay attention to me. In a case of virtual displacement, we don't consider time running, which is, I mean, not, of course, physically possible, but we're thinking that time is not considered here, meaning that this component will be deleted. And that makes my work to be from real work to be virtual work. Okay, that makes sense. What is left is this guy here, this guy here. What I have in this guy is that I have my position where the force is applying, differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates. And then that is then delta generalized coordinates. Okay, now I'm going to use a little bit of different notation in the case of virtual work. So I'm going to have here displacement, virtual displacement multiplied by force. This delta that was used here in the real work, I'm going to express that as a delta like this. Now using this, sorry that is becoming to be a little bit of mess. Let me try to clean this a little bit. Okay this equation, but using a different notation, this delta notation, I can express like this. I have here virtual displacement that is expressed by using virtual displacement of tenorized coordinates, and then something that turned out to be very, very important for us. This is vector that is in a global coordinates this is a vector that is in generalized coordinates. Mm -hmm. Global, generalized. What is a dotted sphere? Mm, that there is a comment like what is a. Mm, that not sure what that means. 
we need to get back to that in a team session. Okay. Oh, oh okay, I think it is a... Uh, okay. I think the question is related to um, this one. Oh, this... Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. This is my mistake. This one here, this here. Forget about it. It's... Um, uh, it's coming from um, this equation editor and I, when I use it the presentation mode it disappears but it's here because my mistake, my apology. Okay, so it's nothing. It just should be removed. Okay, now if this is not looking scary then I don't know what looking scary because this is as bad as get. Why are we torturing ourselves with this? Well, we're doing this because remember the original objective we have. So we have this force expressed in a global coordinates and we wanted to express that, that using generalized coordinates. This guy is doing the trick, he's doing the magic for us. And more specifically or more specifically, this one is doing the mapping because this is going to be matrix with two rows, three columns, because the columns are related to generalized coordinates and rows are related to global coordinates. Hmm, this is it. And look at this. This mapping matrix will go eventually here, so that is converting the force to be expressed by using generalized coordinates. Now it starts to make sense. I mean that of course it's uh, not making much of a sense but don't think about like okay virtual displacement that where is a shop that I can find uh, this virtual displacement like where is that I can purchase the virtual displacement and how it look in real life no 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 this is not that it is a tool it's a, it's a mathematical tool that we need to make this happen so don't think but use as a tool Okay, so this was a virtual work, and now this one here is here, and this virtual, I mean, delta R can be expressed as a, you know, this mapping matrix, and delta Q. Delta R and delta Q relation is mentioned in this matrix here. So let's look at the big picture then. Okay, so this is how you do the differentiation. This is how this mapping matrix eventually reads. You can forget about this this time because later we can uh, get back to this and take a take a look at the details. This is just showing that this is uh, some clever way to make this mapping to be expressed in a kind of pre-computed way. So it's a parcel R, parcel Q. Now I need to tell you something. Now this is of course because of the comments that I see from the uh, chat window, the live chat. So this is time. So I'm gonna make your curve. This is time here and uh, this is my first lecture, my second lecture, third lecture, fourth lecture. This is where we are at. Then fifth. This one axis here is a level of difficulty. You can call it that in another way if you want, but um, I would like to use this a little bit of sophisticated way. So sometimes it's called, a, well, let's just put it in a different way. Okay, so how this curve looked like. So we started here, so it was pleasant. It was all fun. So, uh, so let me use a different color here. So it was a lot of fun here. It was a little bit difficult. There were some peaks here, but not anything too serious. There was a little bit like this here, and then we reached today's lecture. And we went up here. And we can come down here, but then what happens in the uh, next lecture? The screen is not tall enough to solve the level of difficulty. And then we will go down again. So this is how it looks. We're going really fast. We're going really fast, and uh, 
it's simply because mathematical details are not important to you. I would like to go fast about these mathematical details because eventually what I would like to do is that I would like to take a look at the final results and make an interpretation about the final results. Okay, so I see that there is some um, rough comments in uh, live chat, which I do understand. Because this is rough. It is rough. User, okay, let me let me make another drawing here. So user level of master level courses is like here. Now look what we did. We're going to jump this high. So if you staying, I mean, if you're still alive in lecture number six, rest is just downhill. So the rest is downhill is just that you can practically call yourself as a master of science once you get this uh, six legs you're done. Okay. All right, so let's move on. So let's take a look. Here is a full picture. Um, we have here virtual displacement. So virtual displacement is force multiplied by virtual displacement. This is a real force that is applying in your, well, it is expressed by using global coordinates. So it consists of Fi, X, Fi, Y components. So two components. What I will do for this virtual displacement guy is that I'm going to convert this R to be expressed in terms of Q. And now this is a transpose operation. So that makes you feel maybe a little bit confusing. So transpose operation, just um, hold on. Don't pay too much attention to that this time. Anyways, I want to have a relation between the delta R and the delta Q. Relation is given to us by this mapping matrix which you simply get by differentiating the point where the force is, is applying with respect to your generalized coordinates. That's going to give you a matrix that here in the beginning will have a diagonal form and the rest you can get by differentiating your rotation matrix with respect to angle theta and then using vector u bar. Vector u bar tells you where the force is applying with respect to by the reference coordinate system. Okay, why all this hassle? Because once you now substitute this one here, like this one here, you know, this is how it looks. So you have here this mapping matrix multiplied by force. You know, what is left after this delta Q, this is equal to delta Q, is a force is expressed by using generalized coordinates. This one here has a certain name, and the name is generalized external applied forces, meaning that we're using generalized coordinates to express them, and that's it. Whew. So let me see. Okay, so uh, this is like, a, yeah, I know this is like, a, you know, the scary movies that you can find in uh, Netflix and other places. Uh, this is harder than that, much harder than that. So if your kids are not behaving well, you can always make a threat that, okay, if you're not behaving well, you have to follow my lectures. That will do it. For sure it will do it. Okay, this is uh, how the final result looked like. So I have these force and then I have this express that as a moment okay so we're gonna practice this so it's gonna be okay so uh, I know that this is quite bad but we're gonna practice this so many times that it all becomes clear to you now let me see what I have here oh my god I have in class quiz which is extremely difficult Let's see how well you do this. I'm not going to give you any further instructions, no further explanations. Let's just look at this and then I will take a look if I have an example. I do have an example. Okay, here's your in-class quiz. I will leave it open. And let's back get back to that in a, once we look at this example. <clears throat> 
ok ok so here I have bar beam like body where gravity is applying to center of the mass so the gravity is pointing downwards and amount of um, force is expressed in a global corner system such that you know that its uh, components in global x direction is of course zero and its amount in a global y direction is mass multiplied by gravity constant and that's of course minus direct and I'm asking how is this force expressed in terms of generalized corners and now the body reference corner system is located here so what we can do then so let's express point where the force is applied by using the equation that we know very well and then we can differentiate that with respect to generalized coordinates and once that is then this is going to be a vector that will have two rows three columns this is then multiplied by a force and this is going to convert your forces to be expressed by using generalized coordinates so let's make it happen and again we're gonna redo this so many times so no worries okay this is my mapping matrix I'm not gonna do this differentiation but I'm just gonna take the results as it is so this is my mapping matrix and here's my force now I know that this um, because that this is transpose sometimes I'm using transpose here it's kind of simplifies the notation but nevertheless let's take a look so here is my mapping matrix so this consists of two columns three rows okay and this is how it is exactly so this is what converts force to be expressed from global coordinates to generalized coordinates and that's how the final solution look like okay this is what I wanted to use because this is exactly in the corners that I wanted to use in order to solve the system okay now so what do you say was it that uh, was it a little bit of rocky road today I think it was okay so let's take a look at the in class quizzes okay now now if can you guess um, okay there was a question first before we kind of take a look at the result of this there was a question like when is that we can see the correct answers from uh, weekly homework you can see by just logging into um, Moodle side and uh, take a look at that where is uh, the, the weekly homework provided to you so the correct solutions are available in the Moodle website Moodle database so uh, now there are two correct solutions available more will come next week so yeah yeah I think it, I'm thinking too that, that this time it's gonna be success rate yeah I'm gonna just give us you know short and let's see how much, much it is but I think it is um, less than 40 less than 40 but how much less I'm not sure about that. Well, I kind of like this game we have. So, yeah, you can see the Socrates points when I'm um, doing the math. Uh, actually, there is somebody that is doing the, that math for me. So I will ask that uh, that person to do it sometimes, uh, maybe this week, or if not this week, then a bit later. So you can see how is your score. But I have all in my record, so no worries, you will see it. You will see it. Okay, so we have uh, one minute away from closing today's uh, lecture. So, uh, guys, uh, could you please give your answers? So, you need to cast, but this is almost like a voting, so you need to cast your vote. So, but I'm thinking that the success rate today is low. Okay, so first of all, let's look at that one more time. What are the choices here? Where is it? 
Where is this ink last quiz? Did I lost? No, here it is. Okay, what is a role of this mapping matrix? This defines a relationship between the global corners and constraints. It defines a relationship between the constraints and generalized coordinates. It defines a relationship between the global and generalized coordinates. It defines a relationship between the external applied forces and constraints. Here's a hint for you. In kinematics, we discuss about constraints. Now we're discussing about forces, not about constraints. Okay, so with that, did I lose? Hmm. Hold on. Oh my god, I might place it in a. Where is it now? Uh, here, here, here. Here. Okay. Okay, yeah. I don't think we ever got 88 answers today, so success rate in this in class quiz is. Oh my god! 60%. 60% is a good, is good. That's nice. Very nice. With that, so what we're gonna do is that, um, um, can we, maybe we can just go and open the teams right away. And uh, please open the former teams in with this, and not the one that's supposed to get started at five o'clock, but the one that's supposed to get started at six o'clock. So, uh, So see you soon in uh, Teams, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm also surprised that the, the success rate was more than a 50%. It's quite surprising. It is really surprising. So is it that um, I should increase the level of difficulty here a little bit? No, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so we'll close the streaming. And um, see you in the teams momentarily. If not in the teams, take it easy and uh, see you on Monday. Okay.